Recently, I met with a bipartisan group of young environmental activists in Los Angeles at an event sponsored by the University of Southern California's Schwarzenegger Institute, the American Conservation Coalition, which is a conservative group, and Brown Girl Green, a progressive media platform. At the event, young conservative and progressive activists were joined by former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger as they gathered to discuss where they can find common ground on environmental issues. Here are some of the highlights. Republican or Democrat, we will vote you out if you're not committed to those policies. Any way you want to slice it from a business standpoint to a government standpoint to just a personal everyday living and dying standpoint, we need smarter solutions on climate change. The uh, solutions can't be worse than the problem. If we can get rid of pollution, then we don't have to worry about climate change. Mm, that's right. So pollution is really the, the evil. When living next to an active oil and gas well, you can't open your windows in fear of letting more emissions come inside of your house. You can't go outside and play with your, with your friends because going outside can trigger an asthma attack. Actually, we do all want the same thing. We want to breathe, breathe clean air. We want to drink clean water. We want to be able to power our homes affordably. We disagree on things. We might even disagree on a lot of things, but <laughs> I think that was exactly something that shows where there, there is common ground. When I go up to Capitol Hill in Washington and I met with Republican environmentalists, the interesting thing was that they, some of them didn't believe in climate change. With older politicians, they try to really market the same messages that worked for them 40 years ago. It's like, it, the year is 2024. Young people are showing up, we are showing up their activism and advocacy, but we don't have the resources or the support necessarily to push our initiatives forward. If we can just bring communities into the fold and meet them where they're at, that's just something really special. We're not waiting for permission to lead. We've been told as a generation for far too long that we're too young, we're too inexperienced, we're too naive, but we're not waiting and we're charging ahead. If we can agree on, on that kind of basic principle that we've reframed this as an opportunity, then I think people can, can buy into that vision. This is the decisive decade and the most critical point to act and and we all have a stake in this game. And here from both sides of the aisle are youth activist Isabel Brown, author and conservative media influencer, and on the progressive side, Christy Drutman, founder of Brown Girl Green. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me today. You know, your politics may be different, but you discovered through this event in LA that you actually have a lot in common when it comes to climate concerns. Did that surprise either of you? Christy, let's uh, start with you. Yeah, I think there's a lot of discussion around the need for climate action, but I think a lot of times that can get politicized as only one side of the political aisle. And it was interesting to see that there are young people that have opposing political views to me that care about these issues and are trying to advocate in their own, you know, lane and advocacy and community that they're a part of. I felt like that was refreshing and interesting and gave me some glimpse of hope that there might be possibilities to bridge gaps and be able to have, you know, deeper conversations. And Isabel, what was your take? You know, surprisingly, Julia, I wasn't very shocked by our common answers and common values there and wanting to protect our nation's most beautiful places and the world at large. You know, environmentalism is really a generational value of Gen Z and millennials as well. And we're really passionate about caring for the great outdoors, innovating new energy solutions, protecting public lands and more. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for dialogue and common ground on this issue. But that's true of many, many other uh, seemingly partisan political issues, I think, going into the 2024 election as well. So, Christy, what are people your age most worried about when it comes to their respective futures? I think the biggest thing is a crumbling democracy um, and also a crumbling environment, especially as climate change continues to threaten uh, the places we love and the communities we care about. I think young people just don't know what the future looks like and are losing hope and you know leadership right now to actually be able to do the actions necessary to build the world we want to see so a lot of young people are concerned about you know feeling this lack of confidence and who's leading our country today um to really take action on climate change and other you know human rights and social issues at the extent that they need to be 
And it seems like a lot of those young people are very interested in advocacy so they can make a difference. So Isabel, what's your message to young people about advocacy and getting involved? Don't wait for permission to embrace opportunities for leadership. You know, what I love about our generation so much is that we feel this sense of urgency to serve our communities and build a better future for everybody moving forward. And we do feel a bit disenfranchised and losing public opinion by the systems that are currently in place because, let's face it, most of the people in Washington, D.C. have been there for longer than twice the time we've been alive, making the same promises every two, four, six years and saying they're the only people that can solve these problems. But if they actually solved them, they'd be out of a job. And I think we're starting to wake up to that reality, realizing that we can't rely on those older than us to continue doing what's right and to serve our communities. That might have to fall on our shoulders as we climb into the driver's seat of American culture and politics as well. So, Christy, I want to flip that question on its head. What do you think older generations need to know? I think older generations need to know that don't have time to continue relying on uh, extractive industries, the fossil fuel industry, these industries that are destroying our planet and our communities and the environment. We need to move quickly to transition our energy systems. We need to protect communities, especially communities of color on the ground, living on the front lines of these environmental uh, issues and pollutants and damages. And I think the older generation has the resources and the power and the political will to pass legislation and pass policy and really drive the change forward that's necessary that young people continue to demand for in the country today. And they need to start listening to us. Isabel, turning to politics, how do you think Gen Z approaches political labels? Do you think we're seeing less political identification among that generation? I know we are, Julia, and it's very interesting. When you look at newly registered voters, people just graduating from high school or in college, 52% of our generation is registering as politically independent, which is completely unheard of in American political history. But a lot of that has to do with wanting to support policies over blindly supporting politicians or partisan uh, parties that we've just been expected to have our allegiance blindly subscribed to for so very long. I think you're seeing that in shifting demographics on more conservative cultural values being a high priority for Generation Z. If you look at exit polling from 2018, 2020, 2022, and we'll see in 2024, uh, and you're starting to see almost a neck and neck support for both political parties, but it's waning substantially. I think really our generation is looking for a move beyond labels, a move beyond extreme division and partisanship, uh, and trying to reclaim traditionalism, but in a new age way with innovation to boot. So, Christy, when Gen Z, you know, members of Gen Z are looking towards leadership in our, our country, political leadership, I should say, is there a general discontent among that generation when it comes to the lack of bipartisanship we're seeing and, quite frankly, uh, party bickering? Yeah, I think we are seeing so many slowdowns when it comes to being able to get the budget and the funding and the resources necessary to just build basic infrastructure, to get basic policy paths to protect our, the health and safety of our environment and our communities. And we continue to see this type of bickering and slow down, you know, slowing down progress and the things we need to see at the rate we need to see them to address the climate crisis. And so I think this bipartisan bickering continues to reduce confidence, especially in young people, to feel like their leadership can actually get things done during their terms. Um, so that way we can actually see progress happening on the ground in our communities. And Isabel, we're seeing Gen Z really start to get involved in politics. They're starting to vote. The first members of Gen Z have already been elected to political office, including Congress. Do you think we can expect to see a groundswell of Gen Z candidates going forward in 2024 and beyond? I do, but that's going to be an uphill battle. And if you look at the the really leading voices from within our generation taking on those leadership opportunities, I find it really interesting. I cover this in my book that both political parties have been actively campaigning against Gen Z candidates to try to keep incumbents in office. If you look back to 2022, my friend Caroline Levitt, 
uh, was running for Congress there in New Hampshire to be the youngest person ever elected. And Maxwell Frost in my current home state of Florida became the youngest person ever elected to Congress as the first Gen Zer. But both the RNC and the DNC were actively campaigning to keep the older incumbents in office, which speaks volumes to me about the culture in Washington of this wait your turn mentality that young people have been expected to be stupid, uneducated or just unprepared to take on leadership. But the truth is we really are losing an opportunity to share our generational perspective. And we're watching our culture be constantly regulated by those who don't even understand the world that we are continuing to grow up in and come into adulthood in. So I love seeing more cross-generational dialogue be promoted. And I hope that we see more Gen Z candidates from across the political spectrum in 2024 and beyond. That's such an interesting point because the question of age on both sides of the aisle is becoming a big issue here in Washington and on the campaign trail. Isabel Brown and Christy Drutman, thank you so much. You're both very busy jet setters around this country, so we appreciate all your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.